Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Vile and welcome to my A-Level Chemistry YouTube channel. The purpose of this channel is all about getting you ready for your A-Level Chemistry exams and this video is going to focus on aromatic chemistry. Uh, you may have just seen this called benzene chemistry. That's what we're going to zoom, on. zoom in on. We're going to look at the bonding in benzene and then we're going to look at how it reacts as a consequence of its bonding. And then we're going to look at examples of those reactions. So that's the plan for this video. If you find it helpful, remember to like, subscribe and share with your friends and keep checking back for more content. OK, so at this stage, we need to take a little history lesson and think about how the structure of benzene has evolved over time. The first chemist who came up with a sensible structure for benzene was a guy called Kekulé, and he was working off the idea that benzene had the formula C6H6, six hydrogens and six carbons. And you've got to think this is before NMR spectroscopy. Uh, there was very limited technology available to work out the structure. And the legend has it that he fell asleep in his chair one evening and he had a dream about a snake chasing its own tail. And when he woke up from his dream, his epiphany was, oh, benzene must have a ring structure. And he was quite right. Whether that legend is actually true or not, I don't know, but that's uh, what the legend tells us. So he had this idea that the six carbons and the six hydrogens were in a ring. And then he proposed to make this work that it was alternating single and double bonds, as shown in the picture here, with one hydrogen attached to each carbon. And you may still see this structure shown in many textbooks today. It's very helpful, very relevant to us, but it is flawed. And we need to look at the flaws of the Kekulé structure. And I just want to give you a few. The first flaw is that the Kekulé structure implies that benzene will react like an alkene because it has double bonds in it. And we know that that benzene is not an alkene. And the reason we know it's not an alkene is that alkenes undergo addition reactions where you add across the double bond, whereas benzene undergoes substitution reactions. So it's not an alkene, therefore there's a flaw in this single and double bond method. The second flaw is that when you have single and double bonds, the bond lengths would be different. So the Kekulé structure implies that benzene should be a distorted hexagon, some bonds longer than other bonds. Whereas actually modern studies of benzene have shown it to be a perfect hexagon where the bond length is in between that of a single and a double bond. So there's another flaw in the structure. And, and finally, uh, the Kekulé structure implies that benzene wouldn't be particularly stable because it's like an alkene, very reactive, whereas actually benzene is found to be very stable, both chemically and thermally as well. So the Kekulé structure, whilst it's helpful, is flawed, but you may still see it in many textbooks. What we're going to look at now is how we actually understand the bonding in benzene to be. But to do that, we need to look at the bonding in an alkene because it's going to be really helpful for us to understand the bonding in benzene. OK, so on the screen at the moment, I put a diagram. Let's just look at the top diagram here. It's the bonding in ethene. So ethene has two carbon atoms bonded together and then each carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. And it's worth noting that the bond to uh, the carb from the carbon to the hydrogen is a sigma bond, as well as this line here between the two carbon atoms, which is sigma bonds as well. Now, sigma bonds are normally down to the overlap of the s orbitals. But in addition, when you have an alkene, you also have a pi bond or a the overlap of the p orbitals so you can see each carbon has a p orbital going above and below the plane and what you get is this sideways overlap of the p orbitals to create a pi bond so in summary then in an alkene you've got the sigma bond between the carbon atoms as well as the pi bond between the carbon atoms and this pi bond is the overlap of the p orbitals and that becomes important when we look at the bonding in benzene because it's like an extension of this type of bonding. So 
So how does benzene actually react? It reacts by undergoing something called electrophilic substitution. And I'm going to talk you through that in quite a bit of detail. So if you take benzene, which is C6H6, and you react it with an electrophile. Now, electrophile is something that's positively charged that wants electrons. So for the purpose of this equation, I'm just going to call it E plus. And what happens is the electrophile substitutes for one of the hydrogens. So you'd end up with C6H5E, where you've substituted this electrophile in for one of the hydrogens and you kick out H plus as a consequence. So that's the overall reaction for what's going on, electrophilic substitution. The big question is how does this actually happen in terms of the curly arrows? So here is our benzene ring with the pi cloud shown by the circle. And this pi cloud has lots of electrons in it. It's a area of high electron density. So it's negatively charged, in other words, because there's loads of electrons. And along comes our electrophile. We're going to look at what we mean in more detail by the electrophile when we look at the specific reactions of benzene. But the pi cloud, which is negative, is attracted to the positive electrophile, E+. So what we do is we have a curly arrow going from the pi cloud to the electrophile. So we formed a new bond from the benzene ring to the electrophile. And because we've used some of the electrons from the pi cloud, we've left behind a positive charge, which is shown in the center of the ring. And this positive charge gets delocalized over the whole ring. Hence why I've shown the dashed line there, showing this positive charge moving around the whole ring. And we call this the Wieland intermediate. Now, this is actually relatively difficult to do because the pi cloud is very, very stable. It makes benzene very stable. So this requires quite a bit of energy to break this pi cloud. So your electrophile needs to be very, very reactive. And we'll look at that in the next stage and the only reason that benzene undergoes substitution reactions is because in the second stage of the mechanism this carbon to hydrogen bond that is shown on the diagram breaks and pushes electrons back in to the ring and reforms the pi cloud so hopefully you can see here we've now formed a new bond from the carbon to the electrophile and we've kicked out H+. Now a common exam question would be why does benzene undergo substitution reactions rather than addition reactions? And the simple answer is in a substitution reaction you get to maintain the pi cloud. You lose it temporarily but then it reforms in the second step of the mechanism. Whereas if benzene underwent an addition reaction the pi cloud would be broken and it would never be restored and that would not be energetically favorable so the re uh, the reforming of the pi cloud is really important as to why benzene undergoes substitution reactions so what we're going to do now is look at specific examples of these reactions so rather than using general terms where we just say electrophile we're going to look at generating actual electrophiles. So the first one is a nitration. And if you take a mixture of H2SO4 and nitric acid, HNO3, so sulfuric and nitric acid, and you mix them together, long story short, but what you generate is NO2 with a positive charge on the nitrogen and that is our electrophile. So to nitrate a benzene ring, you have your benzene ring here. And you react it with a mixture of the concentrated sulfuric and the nitric acid. And you reflux it below 50 degrees. And the reason you reflux it below 50 degrees is if the me reaction mixture gets too hot, what will happen is you'll get multiple substitution of the nitro group into the benzene ring. So you want to keep this as cold as possible. And the product would be a benzene ring with a nitro group on it.
and we call this nitrobenzene. When you only have one group on the benzene ring, it doesn't matter where you put it, the name would always be the same. The, the naming and the numbering of the groups only matters when you have multiple groups attached to the benzene ring. But for this case, we just call it nitrobenzene. And to do it then, as I say, you use a mixture of conch sulfuric and nitric acid and you reflux below 50 degrees. So this is very, very exothermic. So when you do this practically in the lab, you'd actually do it in an ice bath to keep it as cold as possible. Because you don't want polynitration. The next reaction we're going to look at is called the Friedel-Crafts alkylation. The key phrase is the alkyl bit because we're going to introduce an alkyl chain into a benzene ring. Uh, the Friedel-Crafts bit is just referring to the chemists that came up with this. So you take, just as an example, there are loads of this, but I'm just going to show you as an example. You take your benzene ring, which I've not drawn particularly well there using my mouse, and let's just say you want to introduce a methyl group into your benzene rings, you would use the corresponding halogenoalkane. So for the methyl group, it would be CH3Cl. And you would need to have a catalyst of AlCl3, aluminium chloride. And if you think back to your p-block chemistry, the aluminium in the aluminium chloride is electron deficient. And what it does is it steals the chlorine from the CH3Cl to form AlCl4 minus, and that generates CH3 with a plus on the carbon, which is what our electrophile is going to be. Whenever you use aluminium chloride, it needs to be anhydrous. Remember, the aluminium is highly electron. Uh, deficient so if there was any water there it would react with the water instead which is no good and the product would be a benzene ring with a methyl group coming off it and once again because we've only got one group coming off the benzene ring it doesn't matter where you put that group Okay, next up, we're going to look at the Friedel Crafts acylation. Now, the Friedel Crafts acylation enables you to make a ketone group coming off the benzene ring. And let's see how you do that with an example. You start off with benzene, as you'd have guessed, and you react it with an acid chloride. Now, I'm just going to show you a nice simple acid chloride. An acid chloride looks like a carboxylic acid group except for the OH group has got a chlorine instead. And then this can just be a CH3 group down here. There are other acid chlorides. I'm just showing you an example. We would name this as a little refresher, ethanoyl chloride. Ethanoyl chloride. And what you do is you use the aluminium chloride again as a catalyst. And therefore it needs to be anhydrous. And what happens once again is the AlCl3 steals the chlorine from the ethanol chloride, which leaves you with a carbocation, a positive charge on the carbon here, this one here. And that will effectively be your electrophile. And the product would therefore be a benzene ring that is now bonded to this carbon here. So C double bond O and then CH3. And the byproduct is HCl. That would also have been the byproduct from the previous reaction as well. I forgot to put that on there. Uh, we're coming into land now. We're just going to look at how we introduce halogens into the benzene ring as well.
Okay, lastly then, how do we introduce halogen, halogens into our benzene ring? There are three that we need to know about. Let's take them one at a time. Firstly, chlorine and aluminium chloride will chlorinate the ring. So Cl2 and AlCl3 as the catalyst. Now a little note here on using chlorine. To avoid free radical substitution, you'd need it to be done in the absence of UV light. So the absence of UV. And also because you're using aluminium chloride, you need to be anhydrous as well. And the product would be a benzene ring with a chlorine. which we call chlorobenzene. Uh, bromination, you're going to want to use bromine and iron bromide. And the product would be bromobenzene. And then lastly, for the iodination, you'd want iodine and copper chloride. And you form iodobenzene. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope it was helpful. Please remember to like and subscribe and keep checking back for more content. See you next time.